pertinent uh, when you guys are in the kind of let's say the first few months of, of trading or trading live uh, the guys who've been doing this for a longer amount of time, this is probably second nature to you now, but uh, the guys certainly in months two and onwards, uh, it's probably worth recapping. Uh, and this is about, you know, when we talk in the first week of lectures, uh, and I think I give that news lecture in particular, we talk about economic data briefly there, uh, and about learning to monitor these economic data releases, watch asset prices, um, do the preparation well advance of the release of what exactly it is, uh, who compiles it, what does it mean, how do I um, judge the impact level of a certain data release. Uh, these are all things which we, you know, we tell you guys to, to look at during the first week. Uh, but what this lecture and its intention is, is to kind of just refresh you. And so that although you've probably started on a good footing, uh, good practice doing that every day or forward looking to the next day, is that once you get more experienced, so let's say someone like Will hypothetically sat over there when you've been doing it for let's say 15 odd years almost, it's second nature. He knows um, the importance, values, his realm of expectation of how what is a big move or a big reaction and what isn't and so on and so forth. He just has a better reference point given the uh, the data bank that's formed in his head of what he's seen over a period of time. So what's important then is that for you guys, um, you know, we say and we teach you not to trade over tier one releases. That does not mean that you shouldn't watch tier one releases to see how things like the S&P, T-notes, dollar, even gold, copper, uh, you name it, how does it actually react and how quickly does it move? What does the ladder look like before the data comes out? What does the spread look like? You know, all these different things will help you become then, generally speaking, and the ultimate goal is to improve your intuitiveness about market movement. You know, people often ask, say me and Will about, you know, how did you know that's going to break out at that certain point? It's these kinds of um, experiences and having paid attention at those points irrespective of whether we were trading them or not that's helped formulate a kind of uh, a realm around defining the parameters on what should be impactful and then to what degree and so on and so forth so uh, that's the kind of broader context of this uh, you can see here I'm not going to go through this like it would be delivered by um, one of us during the course. I just want to quickly go over it because I know most of you are probably familiar with these uh, themes. One question I just heard before I really get going though was about is it going to be quiet kind of until Friday because obviously on Friday we have non-farm payrolls. One of the things is head of non-farm payrolls obviously you need to see the jobs data that comes out the analysts will be closely following to formulate their expectations around what non-farms will be like. So far yesterday we had I think it was a two-year high the US ISM manufacturing number particularly strong stronger than expected we saw that initially lift the dollar and the S&P before then a bit of a reversal later on in the session but it's not just non-farms on Friday tomorrow I mean irrespective of the fact today's calendar actually is very quiet we have the FMC minutes this evening but Thursday is actually a fairly busy day and I think one of the words um, that I heard Will talking about, some of the new guys who have gone live, is just about um, actioning a degree of discipline in this type of environment, especially when you know that actually on Thursday and Friday, there's definitely going to be clear opportunity because there's a, a fairly full calendar of potential catalysts to kickstart price action. Uh, quickly looking at Thursday, uh, in the UK you have the service PMI, for example. Now we've already seen the construction PMI from the UK come out earlier this morning. That again, fairly strong, just following on from the manufacturing data, which is also strong, lifted by that weak sterling currency. Uh, but services, as we all know, makes up the large proportion of the UK economy. And therefore, by default, its impact value will be much higher. And certainly cable opportunity I would say looking at the grander scheme of things, you might be better presented with that opportunity tomorrow when that number comes out. Given the number, 
or the PMI numbers at least, have been erring on the side of being better than expected. Obviously, the market is positioned accordingly, so a weak number would definitely have a, a meaningful impact on prices. Uh, elsewhere, you've also got ADP. Uh, we'll look at that a bit closer in a, in a second. That's often seen as the precursor to non-farms. You've then also got the service, the ISM non-manufacturing PMI in the afternoon and the crude oil inventory numbers, which of course are a day later than normal because of the holiday. So there's a lot coming out tomorrow, which will definitely be, I would say, potentially more um, price movement and opportunity than what has been the case in the last couple of hours, certainly for this session thus far. So fear not, the volatility is coming. Anyway, back to some of the slides that we've been looking at. So I guess trying to understand economic data, you need to put it in a realm of monetary policy. And by that, what I mean is that essentially it's the monetary policy and the direction of that which will then dictate the performance of an economy. And what the central banks are doing is assessing this incoming economic data in order to then formulate their expectation of how the economy on various different metrics will perform in the future going forward. So as market participants, traders, we're doing the same. All we're trying to do really is front run of what we think the Fed are going to do. You know, hence you get that kind of uh, positioning movement in the market ahead of let's say a Fed rate decision. By the time if a central bank has done its job effectively, they should have communicated quite clearly what they intend to do meeting to meeting. Hence the reason why you have a schedule of speakers way in advance. Their objective, let's say, is price stability, getting policy from point A to B, whether that's increasing or cutting rates or vice versa. Uh, it's about doing that with as minimal disruption to markets as possible. And so market participants monitor these individual nuggets of information as they come out in order to formulate what we think the Fed are going to do. Let's, I'm going to focus on the Fed as the easiest example, given the minutes of this evening. Think of it most simply as economic data, month to month. I always think of it as a blank canvas. And then every piece of economic data we get out is a, is a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. The only thing is, some things like non-farm payrolls are a bigger jigsaw piece than something like US chain store sales, which are much smaller. But as the pieces of the puzzles start to be connected, we only get around 50% of the canvas complete and I already know, or I can forecast, what the end picture will look like. It's the easiest way I can kind of uh, explain it in terms of how I kind of look at economic data. The, how I've kind of depicted this on the, on the graphic is, as you can see, the central bank decision in the middle I've kind of broken this down into various main categories, let's call them, of which you could define the major economic data. Now, within these slides, I don't really go into every single piece of economic data. I just kind of look at the main ones that we see on a regular basis. So you can see here employment numbers, inflation, growth, the consumer, productivity, and then a broader sentiment ones. So starting with the central banks, because if you're if we're saying that it's the central bank's policy decisions that really dictate the management of the economy and how it thereafter performs, then obviously we want to listen to the central bank directly to gauge then what it is that they're focusing on. What is it that their policy is hinged on which specific sector of the economy in order for them to execute a plan? Now, you could tie this into then forward guidance you know when the reason why we listen to the quarterly inflation report that you get these are feb may august november in the uk staff projections or ecb euro system projections or summary of economic projections and so on and so forth these are the most direct method i guess of the central bank trying to give the market an indication of where they're heading on policy in order to alleviate uncertainty. Certainly from a more real perspective, if I was the CEO of a major multinational company and I wanted to build further infrastructure, let's say more 
manufacturing plants and so on, I wanted to borrow money to, in order to facilitate that, I would need to have a firm idea of where the economy is heading over the next few years and the, and the further horizon to make that decision. So this is why these are very important. Now, quick look at these, I would say they really vary in importance. It's difficult to say this is why you need to listen to central banks month to month and what they're communicating as to how impactful these will be. Now, traditionally, the quarterly inflation report is very important for UK assets because when the Bank of England have tended to move rates or changed uh, a way in which they're leading their policy, they tend to do it around the quarterly inflation report. Now, why would that be? Because not only can they release the interest rate decision, not only can they have minutes, but then they have the projections, like the dot plots, if you like, the UK version of that for CPI and growth, which we can then monitor where we think interest rates will be on the two-year horizon. And then more importantly, Mark Carney and the MPC get to deliver a full press conference. Because unlike the ECB, um, they only do it during the quarterly inflation reports, which is four times a year. So it gives them the ability, if they're going to make a policy change, much like the way that we were looking at the Fed. And the reason why, remember, with the Fed in 2016, September and December were so important was because that was when Janet Yellen would have a chance to also not just make a statement, but follow that with a full in-depth discussion with reporters, economists and so on, why they made that decision. That, again, is looking to um, negate any uncertainty in the market and to be as transparent and clear as possible. And so you really have to take how important these are and how impactful they'll be in the context of the current monetary cycle, is the way I'd say. For the Bank of England, we're kind of in a bit of a sitting, sitting on the hands situation. I don't really see it changing anytime soon. Now, the ECB might get more interesting. Uh, their next projections don't come until March. But obviously in March, if inflation is anything to go by, We've had that big ramp up in Eurozone inflation just this morning, the highest in 51 months, a jump from 0.6 to 1.1%. Obviously, people are going to be looking at, hang about, can the ECB realistically continue to, to pump 60 billion of QE in an environment where inflation, if it kept rising at that rapid rate, uh, you know, this whole kind of taper tantrum idea might start to come into play. So far, the ECB have communicated about their ability to look through short-term blips higher in inflation. Can they maintain that kind of language? So this is how I, I kind of view it. With the Fed, we obviously know about the statement, the minutes, the summary of projections. These are all very important. The Beige Book, I would say, to a lesser degree. This is when you get the, the various uh, regional districts giving their own economic assessment of that specific area, like San Francisco Fed, New York, Dallas, and so on. Uh, that comes out eight times a year but quite honestly i would say that i think the last time i saw that move the market was probably about seven eight years ago so it's way down on the scale of importance comparative to the others on a more regular basis a quick run through then of some of the major data points and again i'm not going to dwell too much on them uh, in great detail because i know a lot of you listening to this are already familiar with this uh, inflation obviously is uh, one of the big things at the moment, certainly something to look out for uh, going forward globally because price pressures certainly are on the, on the movement higher globally, US, UK and Europe. Uh, and this will be a key component to look out for, particularly, I'd say, um, in Europe going forward, given the QE program. What this is then is the core readings is something you need to be very aware of. Now, core readings often get looked at as they extrapolate basically the volatile industries, that being of food and energy. Uh, if you think about the kind of price action that you typically see in oil over the course of the year, the wide range that it trades, food, the seasonality, the weather pattern impacts that you have, it causes those particular sectors to have wild fluctuations. And so therefore, sometimes the market analysts will look specifically at core numbers to eradicate that kind of noise, so to speak. So always be aware of that. Um, the, the breakdown, obviously Will was talking about, know your CPI from your PPI. So consumer price index, retail price index, 
uh, which is X the cost of a home, i.e. mortgages and so forth, and then the producer price index. So looking at consumers and goods comparative to producers uh, and the cost of making those goods. Now on the right hand side I've just got an example of CPI. So here you've got a breakdown of some of the key sectors. This is from the Office of National Statistics of how they measure CPI. And you can see here food and non-alcoholic beverages. We go down, you've got clothing, footwear, health, transport, and so on and so forth. Now, what's quite interesting when you break down something like CPI by sector is that let's take the World Cup football, for example. What do people do when the World Cup is on? Well, exactly. They drink lots of beer. And what does that mean? It means people generally are spending more money on going out. What do you do after you have multiple pints of beer? Uh, make a mistake. <laughs> make a mistake. That, that could possibly be one. Uh, but generally speaking, you would, you know, you go on, you buy other meals and so on and so forth. You can see where I'm heading the day after. I would say most people then order takeaways. And you know, there's inherent relationships there between um, one-off events that can happen and individual sectors that may move. Therefore, the reason what I'm making here is that you can almost foresee where the strength in the, the inflation pressure point will come. If you know that there's going to be in excess demand for alcohol because of a one-off big sporting event, then actually you already can position yourself that that particular area of that will be stronger. And therefore, actually, when it does come out and it's a high reading, maybe then analysts will explain it away as just a one-off seasonal thing or one-off item, as they often refer to it. That can often happen as well. If you look at things like airfares over the Easter period, have you ever tried booking a flight over Christmas, New Year's or Easter? Of course, they know what they're doing. They'll charge you double the price. But then from an inflation point of view, that does actually impact it. But if we know these things, then obviously... I can better identify how much the market I think will move given the seasonal occurrences. So that's a bit of insight into that. Non-farm payrolls, obviously this is coming out on Friday. This is arguably um, the biggest event that most traders will talk about. I actually think that it's massively overhyped myself. I think when I started in the markets back in 2006, the move you used to see on non-farms, if I remember rightly, Will will know as well, was much bigger than you used to than you get at the moment. Uh, I think the movement you get at the moment is extremely choppy and adds a lot of volatility. But in terms of an outright big move, um, I would say this has lessened uh, quite substantially. That's probably because in order to manage monetary policy now, there's many levers that need to be pulled and and things to be managed in that regard so it's not just about a one-off non-farm payrolls is going to dictate what the Fed are going to do what I'm saying is that you actually have to monitor lots of different things they need to take on board things that like how much more globalized the financial markets are what's happening in China is now impacting what the Fed are going to do what's happening with Brexit and the EU negotiations and political uncertainty in Europe is going to impact what the Fed are going to do that was probably, I'd say, to a lesser degree. And so therefore, actually, you can't take such a weight out of one number. Um, also, as well, you've got to listen to what the Fed are telling you. And at the moment, I would say the job situation has been fairly robust. This is an up-to-date graphic. Obviously, we'll get the latest reading um, coming on Friday. But you can see that it's been fairly consistent. We had that one blip lower um, at 24K back in May of 2016. But other than that, I think this US data overall has been, has been fairly strong. Uh, what is it? I mean, in terms of, um, by default, its name, it takes out farm employees. That's because of the seasonality of effect that we just spoke about, about food prices and weather patterns and so on, because that would add disproportionately jobs to the economy via planting season, uh, harvesting, and so on and so forth. So a more cleaner way to look would be to X those jobs out. The total non-farm payroll accounts for approximately 80% of workers who produce the entire GDP of the USA. So often it's referred to as like the lifeblood reading of how the US economy is performing because it's such a, 
uh, a huge assessment of the large proportion of active workers in the US. Uh, what can it move? Well, it can move everything. I mean, from that regard, I mean, you have to look at uh, the dollar. Um, this again, you have to, it's difficult to give it a black and white terminology on how much or which one will move in what order because you need to look at how each asset is positioned going into the event to then identify actually which one might be overpriced or underpriced and might therefore default see the biggest movement. As we've seen much through 2016, actually equities were very difficult to trade on US data because is that bad, is that good? Is bad news, good news, and all. that kind of monetary play was very difficult. Whereas actually, for the dollar, it was a lot more cleaner. So again, identifying those kind of trends and which asset moves most is also a key variable to trade trade economic data. Weekly jobless data, this comes out week to week. Again, in the here and now, beginning of 2017, this data really is irre irrelevant from a, I would say, a market impact point of view. That's because the market's moved on from the job situation and it's fairly happy with the state of play unless something disastrous happens and the Fed can remain on track. Probably what they're more concerned about is what's inflation and growth and how much does this fiscal element of Trump start to come into play? Does that mean that they need to then um, update, change their summary of economic projections or their dot plots? Sentiment data is the other big one, of course. Uh, and this is very important. This, uh, the most easiest example I can give you is, let's say, post-Brexit. That was in the second half of 2016. It's how do consumers feel um, after such a surprising event had occurred? Now, after Trump, uh, likewise, <coughs> most worrying thing, I guess, after Trump was that actually US consumers are the most confident they've ever been ever since the, before the financial crisis. And so if you thought that it was going to create uncertainty, it's done quite the opposite, actually. Um, but these, this one here that I've got as an example is Michigan, um, reported twice a month, preliminary and final. And as you well know, of the two, it's always the preliminary one which is more important because that's the first factual time that we actually see the data set. Whereas the final is just essentially a revision to that number. The prelim report includes 60% of all responses. So like I said, with that example about the kind of picture, formulating an overall picture, once you've already painted half of it, you've already got an idea of what it looks like. And if it's 60% complete canvas, I can pretty much already set of what I think is going to be the end result. Hence, the final reading is really has a, has a muted impact. Other ones looking more European based, IFO, business climate. This is arguably the most important data that comes out of Germany. Um, just quickly, there's a distinct difference between IFO and ZEW, both for Germany. Now, you often hear ZEW mentioned. I would say that takes a second place to IFO. Now, the reason for that is because IFO is based on 7,000 responses from companies in manufacturing, construction, wholesale, and retail. ZEW is a sentiment survey of economists and analysts. So the difference here is you've got companies, people in industry, cross-sector, of a large amount, 7,000, comparative to a relatively small sample size, but economists and analysts. You would think the guys on the ground have got a better insight into what they think current conditions are and their expectations over the next six months. I read an article this morning talking about how wrong economists got 2016 because of the <laughs> obvious things we know now, retrospect, Brexit, Trump, so on and so forth. Um, and so following that, it's not going to change anytime soon. I thought will still probably remain the more lead indicator from a sentiment point of view. Other things that we've seen, uh, we've had ISM manufacturing just yesterday that was very strong in the US. Uh, it's a survey of um, more than 300 manufacturing firms and the importance of that was because it's from the Institute of Supply Management. So think of the major industry body that measures that particular uh, sector. It measures purchasing managers supply chain measuring business confidence. So again trying to 
predict what the Fed are going to do in the future, these forward-looking uh, nuggets of information are really essential for traders to know, to see how confident businesses are going forward. Now, these are broken down in constituents to help see each individual kind of, I guess, part of the chain, i.e. the employment situation. So we'll get ISM manufacturing or non-manufacturing tomorrow, as you can see here. That will also be important because we'll be looking at the employment constituent in order to better forecast what we think the Bureau of Labor Statistics non-farm report will be on Friday. We also get new orders, prices paid, so we can measure the inflation element, inventories, uh, and production. So you can see here, even in this one report of ISM, you're pretty much ticking most of the boxes to measure on various different levels the US economy, hence these are important data releases. Uh, moving on, US GDP, high importance of course. Um, one thing actually to add on this was that there's something which I'm not sure if uh, you guys follow at the moment, but the Atlanta Fed, that's the specific regional Atlanta Fed, they have a very accurate GDP model forecast that they use. It's available on the, the Atlanta Fed website. That gets updated after US economic data. And what I did see yesterday was a, a substantial upgrade to the forward-looking projections for US GDP on the back of the strength that we had in the manufacturing sector yesterday. These are things that you can watch. That Atlanta Fed GDP tends to be a fairly good predictor then of what the actual Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA, which is the government agency, of what their official GDP number could look like. So that's the kind of deeper level of analysis, if you like. Uh, of course, three readings. So this is taking that impact diminishing value of the Michigan sentiment idea, another step. So you've got advanced, preliminary and final. Um, and the report seems the main measurement of overall economic activity, as you know. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on the, the IP and cap utilization because that's medium importance. Uh, housing data as well, these are, I've classified as low importance, uh, but as you know well that during the financial crisis, if this was 2009, 2010, this would ultimately be probably the most important data. Uh, there's a distinct difference between starts and permits, new home sales, and existing home sales. So if you look at housing starts, building permits, um, it's a survey of home builders nationwide used to measure new residential construction projects. So strong economic environment, people would have confidence to purchase a new home. Whereas new home sales, uh, this is conducted by US Commerce Department, it's seen as a lagging indicator for demand but may impact mortgage rates. Existing home sales uh, does not look at newly built homes, it measures the number and prices of existing single family homes, condos and co-op sales over a one month period. So lagging indicators often reacts to changes in mortgage rates. So you can see how it, they're all different part of the cycle of the housing market. But again, these data points have been up at pretty much the best levels of near 10 years. Hence the reason why the Fed were able to execute that rate rise in December. Uh, last couple of slides to round things off. Retail sales, uh, consumer data is the kind of section I've put this under. Uh, this is always an important data release. Uh, the core number, again, as we said earlier, is always very important to X out the kind of volatile sectors like auto and gas. There's also a thing called the control group, uh, which gets closely followed specifically for the US retail sales number. Uh, but you can see here the breakdown on the wheel or the pie chart by color of what's the most important. Now, you often probably hear squawks or see news stories about Ford Motors, North American motor sales. You get the same for GM, Audi, and so on. Now, actually, they're quite good indicators of actually how the overall health of the US retail market might perform for that month. That's because it has a 20% proportionate value of the overall uh, makeup of the retail sales report, which is defined by 13 major types of retailers. You can see the smallest 
being sporting goods, hobby and music, but things like motor vehicle, parts, dealers, food, beverage, general merchandise and so on uh, carry a greater weighting. So news, external to those figures, but surrounding those sectors can often give you a little nugget as well of information in order to better forecast what you think uh, the state of play is for the retail sales environment for that month. Uh, other things, consumer confidence, personal income spending, there are other uh, important numbers that come out of the US. From a consumer confidence point of view, obviously, as I said, in the US, we're riding up at the highest level since pre-financial crisis. That essentially is just five questions in total, two on economic or two on current economic conditions and three on future expectations. Again, this is quite a re recurring theme, I'd say, with economic data and what is important for how financial markets are priced and where they potentially might heading is about what these indicators show for future expectations how confident are people how much may they spend and so on and so forth uh, last slide because I always get this question and I always go over it with the new guys but just to look at it in a more clearer format is the three major um, energy related news flow that we get on a, on a scheduled basis that being Genscape, the APIs, the American Petroleum Institute and the DOE's the Department of Energy so these are your infantry levels, your measurement of looking specifically at the kind of supply update or the infantry update uh, of North America so Genscape twice a week now, this is on a typical week. Whenever there is a US national holiday on a Monday, all of these essentially get bumped a day later, as is the case this week, given the New Year holiday. But Genscape's always the first one that comes out. Now, there's two readings. Thursday is completely unimportant. That's because by that point, we've already had Genscape part one, API, and DOE. And so by that point, the movement if you like, has occurred, the market has priced accordingly. But the Monday can have an impact. Obviously, we had the big sell-off in oil yesterday afternoon, and that did coincide. It's not solely on that reason, but the Genscape number was a large build of around a million. Now, that might then add to some pre-positioning ahead of what people's expectations might be then for the APIs. Now, the API represents more than 80% of the total refinery production. The difference between the APIs and the DOEs, which is this is government, whereas this is an institute, is the API is voluntary, whereas there's a legal requirement for major oil firms to complete their infantry surveys for the DOE number. Hence, as well as the timing, of course, the DOE one comes out during NYMEX pit trading hours, whereas the API one is after the NYMEX close and late in the evening after half nine London time. So volume, liquidity, is also adds to the size of the move and the volatility associated with this release. So as I've given it an impact score, I would say Genscape low, API medium, and then the DOE's higher. Uh, the API and DOE is should be 90% the same is the statistic I could find but as you've seen you often see one in the complete opposite direction as the other why that occurs I, I, I'm not going to try to to give you an answer because I don't have one but all you can do is go off the fact that actually longer term statistically the two are quite closely correlated and if you're going off um, the positioning of the market then you have to just take it as the API is as how the market is built in for what's expected and then act accordingly uh, okay gonna gonna finish there uh, I'll leave this last slide up for a few moments um, it has a couple of links uh, Investopedia trading economics obviously there are two ones which I'm sure you have used every day if you don't then you should because one final word is you should not ever trade a piece of economic data I feel if you do not at least know what it is I think to trade something and not know what it is is unacceptable in my my book um, ultimately you're gonna open yourself up 
um, to something at some point getting you in a sticky situation unnecessarily. You know, as an absolute core base of knowledge, you should have this kind of idea of where these data points come from, how they're compiled, what they mean, and how important they are. Um, other websites to look at, Federal Reserve, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Conference Board, ISM, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, these are all US focused, um, but they all have quite good explainers of how they compile data and so on and so forth, so worth taking a visit if you have time. Okay guys, gonna leave it at that, hope that was uh, useful. Any questions in the chat, just let me know.